Yeah, this is a really important question.、Um, because if you think about、uh, China's domestic and overseas investment in infrastructure,、uh, we are in fact witnessing a planetary shift. Right. And in some ways, this is an acceleration of you know, Western development doctrines、uh, that were propagated in the latter 20th century and have simply been taken up and amplified、uh, in China's current policy platform. But in other ways, they're, they're different、uh, from that as well.、Um, and one of the key differences is that、um, I would say the, over, the overarching policy priority here is to construct. Networks of transportation and energy flow that enable the continuous flow of commodities globally. I would say that's the overarching priority for China's global infrastructure investments.、Uh, because,、um, contrary to the perception in the West, where like、uh, communism and capitalism are seen as sort of like totally opposed,、um, in In、uh, Chinese political theory,、um, capitalism is understood as an engine of communist politics, right? So, in order to、um, uh, ensure and perpetuate、uh, you know, the work of the Communist Party, you have to have a capitalist growth engine. And that capitalist growth engine is, of course, global.、Uh, and so, I think that、um, that worldview. Um, helps explain、uh, the dramatic economic changes that we've seen in China、uh, since the open up and reform、um, in 1978. And it also helps us understand the kind of logic of investment patterns that we've seen extending globally from China、um, since the turn of the millennium.、Um, Often they can be mischaracterized in Western audiences as like, oh, China's not playing by the rules, or it doesn't make sense. They don't seem to be motivated by quarterly profit returns. <laughs> right? It, there's a little bit uh, uh, different of a temporal horizon, and that's because the priority is circulation, long term stable circulation as an engine for political stability,、um, as opposed to sort of quarterly or short term returns. This is like the best summary that I can give. And of course, there are immense social and environmental and ethical contradictions,、um, which, also, so, <laughs>、uh, which also need to be、uh, engaged and explored. Well, it's interesting.、Um, So, I think national borders are a kind of、uh, jurisdictional organizing logic, right? At its most simplest, it, it tells us, okay, which institution is responsible for which places? <laughs>、um, and so, from a bureaucratic standpoint, I think that's the most basic function that they play. But of course, in reality, it's much more complicated than that because borders get wrapped up with national identity, with ideas,、uh, with realities and fictions of cultural difference. And then they become methods for、um, excluding、uh, some and including others,、uh, for excluding things that、uh, dominant interests decide that they don't like, like, for example, polluting industries and including. Other things like high value commodities, right? So they become,、uh, so from a geographer's standpoint, I'm a geographer. So from a geographer's standpoint, I understand it as a kind of spatial、uh, technology to、um, where different, that different groups use to get the things that they want and to attempt to exclude the things that they don't want. At its very simplest explanation. Um, but of course, the question of boundaries uh, becomes uh, much more interesting when we think about it in relation to outer space.、Um, what immediately becomes clear, especially、um, when we think about、uh, equatorial countries, is that some countries' boundaries or borders seem to be harder than other countries' borders. Some countries have the power to say, This is my border, I get everything within it, and others don't have that power. 
And a key example in light of the geopolitics of outer space is in fact one of the most important orbital locations around the Earth, which is called the geostationary orbit. And this is if you were to stand at the equator and look up maybe 35,000 kilometers, uh, this is a very useful place because if you put a satellite in the geostationary orbit, it orbits at the, at the same speed as the Earth. So it's always above the same point on the Earth, and this enables global satellite communications because you can bounce a signal off this satellite. You always know it's going to be right there. So from a national boundary step, uh, standpoint or a national border standpoint, um, in 1976, a number of uh, countries located at the equator got together and said, hey, this is directly above our national territory we should have some power or control over this. And of course the global hegemons at the time, not equatorial states, the US, Russia, they said, no, that, that borders don't go up that far. <laughs> and so because of this debate, right, how far up do the borders go? Um, the US still officially has not declared where outer space begins and where Earth ends, right? Even though globally, internationally, there's there's a consensus about this, right? If only because of the fact of physics, there's some places that are airspace because that's where you can fly an airplane. And then eventually you run out of atmosphere and it's not airspace anymore. So then it's something else, right? So this is a really, this is just one example of how thinking about the traditional geopolitical questions of national borders and territory, uh, becomes very different when you start thinking about going up into infinity into outer space.